David Merson, heart sore in the way of old activists, a stooped, unkempt 48, leaves through his so-called love life for precedent and finds none. <laughs> Waiting in a parked car overlooking an arroyo induces introspection. The other guys in Epic share the leanness of long outrage, frequent marathons, and enduring luck with women, but obsession has not been good to David's relationship. His days spent tracking the toxins that bleed through watersheds, questioning children in hospital gowns printed with teddy bears, inking cancer clusters onto topo maps, bringing his particular skill set to bear, his milky mildness, what his second ex calls his anti-charisma. <laughs> the hangdog air of bewilderment that makes even dying children strive to enlighten him. The harmlessness that glints through his wire ribbed specs when he shakes hands with some CEO or other, except by now they mostly know better than to let a big wig sit down with Dave. <laughs> Don't even so much as nod when you pass him through the courtroom hall, they're told. Despite his scruffiness, one judge told him to get a haircut. <laughs> he is sleek in pursuit, righteous. Relentless, a scorner of compromise, a true believer, whose own luck with women was flawed, leaving him grateful for joint custody. David loves his two sons with the appalled passion of a dad whose work acquaints him with small coffins. From his right hand to the hollow of a kid's well-worn glove runs a tight, taut thread of inevitability. The ball held aloft and displayed, Dad, look! In the making of a boy's psyche, this is the key phrase. It's David's job to arrange plenty of occasions for its happy proclamation. Dad, look! His rendition of Goodnight Moon is famous for the oinks, whistles, and cheek pops, embracing the line, Goodnight noises everywhere. <laughs> He's fed trembling white mice Coca-Cola from an eyedropper for the sake of fourth grade science. Though his co-worker's connection in the Animal Liberation Front would rip his heart out and nail it to the front door. <laughs> Environmental Protection Information Center. If they found out. His abuse of white mice with their tiny old lady hands. Their suffering docility is an unusual departure from the party line. Though they have long since abandoned Echotage, the five mem members of Epic Hue to the rituals of brotherhood, to their affinity group habit of staying up until two or three, burying their souls, though they do now so under the harassing buzz of fluorescence, tipped back in ergonomic chairs, ties loosened, feet up on the desks, variously avalanched or anals, David's anal, when in the old days it was shirts printed with raised fists, army surplus sleeping bags, a high desert campfire, Sucked toward the moon, shooting sparks. Ice may be melting out from under polar bears. Breast milk brims with mutagens, but change has never ever before touched heaven. Not deeply, not at the level where they are bonded. At David's wedding last Saturday, they slouched in attitudes of conscientious celebration. <laughs> they kissed the bride, they sang David's praises, and then told her when she was done with the saluzer to give him a call. They stuck orchids behind their ears. And David alone understood they were holding back, and why, of the five of them, he was the reliable loser in matters of the heart. And the phenomenon of jade, the fearful symmetry of teeth and cheekbones, plus the fact that she's on the other side. The sexiness of her being basically the enemy can be neither assimilated nor forgiven. The wedding's meticulously repressed question, what does she see in him? <laughs> in his right to talks, David had shrugged, reading minds he'd been reading half his life. They could have a little more faith, though. For a profoundly good man to find love shouldn't strain credulity. David caught himself thinking, profoundly good, and palmed his thinning facial hair in a matter Jade recognized as embarrassed or sad. She lifted her brows. What's wrong? He'd slung her over his arm, leaned in as if kissing were drinking, held her practically horizontal until people said, Aw. 
But it was a moment's uncensored private felicity, felicity to have meant it. Profoundly good. He'd earned it. What he regrets now is not that thought, but the ruefulness of his gesture, calming the hair, the mild, contrite, revisionist embarrassment, so that she'd have to lift her brows to wonder what was wrong, when nothing was. In the Arroyo, a couple of wrecked trucks sail past a rusted washing machine, a listing doorless refrigerator, tires of various sizes and degrees of rottenness, a cathedral window's worth of shattered glass and the jutting wing of a small plane. The boys love coming here, because nowhere else are they permitted such an array of dangers. Prickly pear, anonymous stained underpants, <laughs> rusty nails, rattlers, Actually, the altitude's too high for rappers, but the boys reject this fact. <laughs> Before he lets them out of the car, David lectures. Careful, careful, careful. The poison echo of small coffins. Down in the arroyo, out of the sight, they look after each other. A good thing for brothers to learn. They are stepmother now in fairy tale jeopardy. Though in taking them on, Jade has shown an easy, can-do confidence. She read up on step parenting, and it turns out that beauty figures even there in the reconfigured family calculus. The boys defenseless as their father. Regarding love, David has always been a doubter, a holder back, the lukewarm opposite of his passionate work self. As a husband, he was often described as just not there. <laughs> and he had accepted, as deserved, the amicable breakups of marriages one and two. Along came Jade. They had gazed, eaten, drunk, fucked, the usual plot, but then fucking took over. The great power of fucking had been awakened, and they fucked themselves mutually transparent. <laughs> fucked their way to a dazed adoration, discovering there this clandestine status in being just the two of them. This insolent sexual satisfaction, coexisting with the improvisational restlessness of genius. This safety. This bliss exempt from inhibition and nagging history. Neither one bothering, neither needing to explain their hasty marriage, because it was natural to want to seal such transcendent fucking with that cultural kiss of approval. <laughs> Dubious though you were otherwise about that culture. Coming to the Arroyo's edge, he can make out the boys' voices and guesses their intent on intergalactic slaughter. <laughs> Lasers, viruses, dirty bombs, their games incorporate everything there is to fear. This is good for them, David believes. Hey, Shane, Edmund. He calls these sort of names, Ratch Hand, Dandy, chosen by two of the three women he's loved. And from the hush that follows, figure he's been heard. A scrap goes by, and David stumps. This is the usual lawlessness, the regular Joe's cost-effective contempt for the environment. People find this wasteland irresistible, free dumping. <laughs> Showing a perverse initiative, somebody has carted an oil drum out to the tip of this stony spur where the road dead ends. The human love of shortcuts accounts for a lot of devastation, David thinks. The, H the ADHD species. Distracted from the story unfolding down at the level of chromosomes or up in the ozone. He releases his scrap to the wind and it's whisked away. As if a signal has been given, more bits and pieces swirl past. The dervish blowing by, revealing an object he had mistaken for a plank or a beam sticking out of the oil drum is in fact a furled rug. It seems undamaged. And as David puts an arm around it and levers it out, a kamikaze egg carton rears up and crushes into his shoulder. He studies the oil drum seed. Tin cans, a partially melted telephone, a doll's head trailing singed acrylic hair, a coil of filthy rope, a shirt stippled with blood, a clock, rain-fattened paperbacks, eggshells, ashes, a melee of electrical wire, a high-heeled shoe. As he works it loose, the rug dislodges a cascade of junk that tumbles along the ground. Light bits scattering, heavier things rolling this way and that. Something, an envelope, wings by, nicking the corner of his eyebrow. Wouldn't be anybody, panting, left to operate lasers. <laughs> Wrong. Somebody lived because they hit him. 
They came clamoring over the slope. Caves that, like, connect a whole underground city! <laughs> Reaching the Arroyo's rim, the half-brothers come to a halt and stare. Squatting, David peels back a corner of the rug. With only a few square inches revealed, the workmanship is unmistakably fine. Hey, guys, look what I found. For a breezy moment, they ponder the scene. Litter skittering and dodging past. The moon catches their eye whites. Two hours reckless play brings out the brother in them. So, one brother's cool slids in its knife blade through the bonds of character. Hey, show some fucking interest in what dad found, why can't you? <laughs> <laughs> Ordinary, and despite the unfairness of enforcing rules in this male wilderness, David would have to deal with fucking. <laughs> he does a quick check. Edmund does not appear hurt, only newly separate from his older brother. His eye whites glitter. Not with boredom either. Freshly relieved of intimacy, both boys are radiant. David gives the rug a good yank, and it thumpingly unrolls. Wow. Wow! David sits back, sits back on his heels, trying and failing to understand to account for the intrusion of marvelousness. The rug's fantastic, fanatically executed geometry interrupted just at the point of rigidity by winding organic movement, delicate leaves, impish, impish involutions. This diversion, this near escape from the paralysis part of its tail, its secret proper with the bristling, incomprehensible beauty of bees dancing within a hive. Vision inspired by the challenge, but the mind's movements tentative, repeatedly stubbed out. This agitating, impenetrable beauty, the work of how many nights and days, its blood reds and ominous crimsons, contending with, outnumbered by, a choir of blues, jade feather, baby blanket, forget me not. But to number them like that, to try to say what they're like, that's merely a poor, doomed attempt to domesticate them. They are glorious blues, and they assail a peace of mind. In the center, there is an oval where nothing happens visually, and this is the indeterminate dun of animal camouflage, of a doe fading into the underbrush, and what appears to be peaceful is really another wild evasion. Edmund, at nine, still sometimes playing the baby, hangs an arm around his neck. You pulled that out of the garbage, Dad? <laughs> it shouldn't have been in there. Shane leans, leans into David from the other side. Why was it, Dad? <laughs> I have no idea. No taint of yeast or compost, no halitosis of slowly souring milk carton, no oil drum deck that mars the rug's dry, antique compound of grass, twine, stone floor. Edmund says, I want to see in the can. Honey, there's nothing else in there. We've talked about syringes and dangerous sharp things and how the guys handling garbage wear gloves. You didn't wear gloves. <laughs> he tries a technicality and some italics, an old parenting technique. I wasn't reaching down <laughs> into the garbage. The rug was right on top, and I was carefully, carefully, carefully pulled it out. Dad, I really want to see. Father and son go over and peer into the oil drum. Garbage. Okay, David says. Behind them, Shane wings stones at the drum until David says, Cut it out now. Shane pitches a last defiant stone, and the drum gives off the resonant gong of a bullseye. Edmund runs back to try to match his feet, and David decides to let him have at it, because what can they hurt? He rolls the rug up tight and improvises a kind of fireman's carry. The metal whines and the stones whang against it. The brothers have refined their name. And as David grapples with the rug, shoving it into the car, he takes immense pleasure in his boy's prowess. There may be no deeper pleasure on earth. He pauses to admire them. They sense this. It throws their aim off. <laughs> they want to be fatherless. Motherless, outcast, a cunning tribe of two. Their terrible prey, black, squat, stinking like a bear, moaning when it's dinged. 
Before they can leave this place, the spirit of the bear that the oil drum mysteriously incarnates must be stoned back to the underworld. If there were no boys throwing stones, that spirit would never have emerged from the underworld in the first place. <laughs> Put a stone in a boy's fist and the whole world breathes out reeky ghosts. <laughs> the Pleistocene lives on in the heads of boys. In fact, three-fifths of Epic believe that we're headed back that way. When weather chaos descends big time and the center cannot hold, humans will regroup as hunter-gatherers. That's the optimistic view. <laughs> but the other faction of Epic believes can be boys, since David is one. They are fathers, and certain thoughts are forbidden to fathers. Annihilation. <laughs> Universal extinction. Nestle, still tightly rolled in the rear of the station wagon, the rogue's strangeness is muted. It could rightfully be his, bought and paid for. David calls for the boys to get into the car, but finally has to start the engine. David's own dad's long ago threat before the boys climb in. <laughs> They're overextended, he figures, long past the hour when they should have been freed of the intensity of their love for each other by the bleeding electronic triviality of Game Boy. <laughs> It's stacking up our car, Eddie complains, and Jane chimes in. It smells all old. Hey, does everything have to be new? Plastic? Old's not such a bad smell, is it? But pleating is always a wrong move. <laughs> it's not ours, Edmund, doing a good imitation of Jane. She's new enough that they shouldn't be able to mimic her so well. <laughs> the boys' deft appropriation of Jay's voice and style when they want to drive home a point slightly worries Dave and feels unfair as if he's being ganged up on. Well, it's ours now, sweetie. Sweetie is fatal. <laughs> Registered in jolting silence. Jolting because the next 30 miles are so bad. The road seeming as lost as a road can get, running aimlessly along that madly swerving, barely managing to avoid outcrops of rock or steep drop-offs. You mean you can just take anything out of the garbage, whoever left it there, and if they want it back, you can say, no, it's yours? Shame. Pent at 11 on discovering the moral workings of the world. A hard curve. And as he slows the car, David tries his mostly successful good father voice. Look. I don't want you going through any garbage ever. You never find anything good. <laughs> you did. You did. Jane says, it must be worth a fortune. Twenty or thirty thousand dollars even, depending on how old it is. Somebody is going to want that back. But how could it be left in a garbage can? The whole thing sounds fishy. I've never seen anything like that before, except in a museum. And why didn't I know you go for these drives? Was that a thing you did before? Before her. Were you really just having a bad day? Is something going on? Do we have secrets now? The rug is a problem, David. There's been some kind of mistake. Because this isn't the sort of thing that gets thrown away, not ever. You took it? What makes you think you could just walk off with it? Okay, which question do you want me to answer? <laughs> it had clearly been thrown away. At the end of a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Nobody was coming back for it. It was getting dark. I just think you were a little hasty, she says. Impetuous. And he shouldn't be flattered, but he is. <laughs> Draw me a map of how you got there. Her love of proof. Documents, evidence is very like his. And on the back of an envelope, he sketches a map. A journey's last leg, a swiggle, meant to indicate arduousness, culminating in a cartoon oil drum. This is your secret guy place? There's nothing there. That's what's good about it. He wants to explain further, to point out the sadness of there not being many unowned places left. But she's already asking. How do you know no one was coming back? Maybe the real owner is there right now, looking, and it's gone. Cross-legged on their bed, husband and wife consider the rug unfurled across the tiles of their bedroom floor, and he watches under the lower lids of her downward gaze the rem-like movements of her eyes as she reads, or tries to, 
the rugs branching and turning in dead-ending intricacy. Its profusion of leaves and petals, or the geometric figures that might be leaves and petals, which the gaze barely discerns before relinquishing them back into abstraction. Jade, leaning forward, her elbows on her knees, frowning, her right breast indented by her right arm, her shadow thrown across it because her reading light's on, her backlit profile showing the radiant glint of her upper lip, the angle of her jaw, the length of her throat, and below that the contour of the heavy breast, the nipple's surprisingly drab brown color, the unaroused, modest softness of its stem, its wreath of kinked hairs. Best of all, in love, in what he's experienced of love, these are the moments where you can watch the other's self-forgetful delight. She says, I have to tell you something. In work, he's a good listener. More than that, he solicits the, tr he solicits the truth, asks the unasked, waits out the heartsick or intimidated silences every significant environmental lawsuit must transcend. Someone has to ask what has gone wrong. And if the thing that's gone wrong is destroy the marrow of a five-year-old's bones, somebody has to need that truth or will, it will never emerge from the haze of obfuscation. But this isn't work. This is Jay. I'm a little afraid, she says. I know that's not like me. This, this is hard. Whatever it is, you can tell me. Whatever it is, you can tell me. Whatever, you can tell me. I'm a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> He'd been blind to the syllogism of chalk on the board. X is a corporate lawyer. All corporate lawyers are Republicans. X is a Republican. The outrage that blazes through him makes the leap to her. When she says, I knew you couldn't handle it. Her tone is prosecutorial. You waited until we were married? <laughs> until I thought you could deal. <laughs> Dismay is cranked so high, his pulse ticks in his temples. I'm having trouble believing this. <laughs> calm down, calm down a little. Just try seeing it's love, my telling you. It's wanting no secrets between us. The deception, he says. The hiding who you really are, when you know how I feel about lying. I needed it too, every minute of it, but I couldn't lose you. That makes us like everybody else. Lying, being lied to, it doesn't. We aren't. She catches hold of his wrist. Are you all right? He waits until she lets go before saying, lying, wasn't I? You must have thought, he is so easy to fool. <laughs> she changes tactics. David, let's deal with the other issue first. Say the rug was in the office of some <laughs> Los Alamos scientist, and one day somebody ran a guide encounter over it, a random check, a sweep, because they're human, accidents happen, and despite the most meticulous precautions, they're not meticulous enough, he says. And he knows. Traces of uranium stick to the soles of somebody's shoes and get tracked across the rug, and out of fear for their jobs, they decide to dispose of the rug in this furtive, undocumented way. The sort of thing you're always telling me about. You, who are the expert on how contaminants get into the air, and into the water, and into people's houses, you bring it home. <laughs> into our house. With no clue as to why it's left in a trash can. This just isn't wise. I love you as the expert on wise decisions. My politics are my own. And I could have gone on keeping them myself. Ultimately, I chose not to, because you and I tell each other everything. One of us does. <laughs> so, hey, you're the honesty prince. But this is new territory for me. You're the first person I ever wanted to tell everything to. I needed to work up to it. Is that a crime of needed time? There is nothing wrong with this rug, he says. <laughs> You're being paranoid. There is something, she says. I can feel it. 
For the first time, he says, how you feel doesn't interest me at all. He's let down. Then, without a word, Jay turns out the light. If they were both wolves, they'd be lying just like this, their senses on alert, their fur on end. How about a little red in tooth and claw sex? <laughs> he wants her. But who is she? She may intend to amend the Constitution to rule out gay marriage or drill for oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve. How can he fuck somebody who wants to drill for oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Reserve? <laughs> At the same time, he's hard. <laughs> Most importantly, he can convince her that the caribou have rights to their ancient migratory roots. He's not sure where she is in his, her progress towards sleep, and when he bends over her, the intense repose of her body on the bed tells him she's wide awake. The treachery, another in a string of deceptions, exhausts him, and he gives up. He's asleep. Before dawn, he's startled by her cry. He can't make sense of her naked, placitory stance in front of his computer or his own accusation. What did you do? His voice is rough, his body recollecting their flight, their fight, before his body does. I walked across the room, and I must have picked up some static electricity, because when I touched the computer, I got a shock, and he scrambles from the bed, the rug's nape pricking the toe soles of his feet. It crashed. It made this little match strike sound, and the screen went blank. David, I wasn't going to look. Well, then what was she doing there? He never confides in her about his work. He is tediously ethical that way. She could end up representing a corporation he's going after. I wasn't going to look. The repetition really scares him. Her fingertips patter across the keyboard. Panic tenses her shoulders as she leans over her, his laptop. Her hair sticks up in tufts, dirty with yesterday's gel, and for the first time, he finds her unattractive. Leave it, he says. And she says, let me just... His chest hurts. Is this a problem? Should he be paying attention? No, it's okay. It's his heart. It's only that his chest has been constricted with frustration and another emotion. Uglier, more imperative, pounding away. A fury. This weird thing happened. Sunday afternoons, the boys and their belongings trek back to the home house of Shane's mother, Suzanne, according to an agreement hashed out with Nina, Edmund's mother, an <laughs> academic on a year sabbatical in Paris. Nina trusts Susanna, but then so does almost everyone, including David. He sits with Susanna on the back steps, the boys dodging through the neglected garden, whose sunflowers are ten feet high, yellow petals tattered by the brown, saucer-shaped centers under attack by sparrows. Never gonna make it out alive unless we find a way to neutralize. Hours ago, Jade walked across the rug, acquiring a crackling charge of electrons that flew from her fingertips to his keyboard. Case is compromised. The irreplaceable interviews, the painstaking <coughs> documentation, zapped, and yeah, he has some of it on discs, but not all. An uncharacteristic lapse, one he is going to have a hard time forgiving himself for. When I finally got to the guy I always relied on, he said, it's permanently fried, David tells Suzanne, which is bound to cause problems in a number of cases. But the worst part is, I don't know what she was doing with my computer. She has no business touching it. Maybe she was looking for incriminating email. That's the usual reason for fooling around with another person's computer. She must want to find out about your life before. It's not like that. I don't think so. She could be looking, trying to find out what things were like between us. No, I don't think so. She hadn't wanted the letdown. She sees us more like a clean slate kind of thing. Or a lightning strike. An angel's wing passing over their upturned faces. From the shoes ranged on the wooden step, shoes with neon glyphs, striped shoes, shoes with soles, thick as antelope hooves. Shoes bristling with spikes, 
Susanna chooses one whose laces are a gray snarl and begins with her dirty fingers to pick the knot. She says, you do barely know her. Angry at her superbly divorced reasonableness, <laughs> the very quality he loved a minute ago, he says, the rug is evil. <laughs> David, things aren't evil. People are, and not even many of them, though I can see it by your line of work, leads you to suspect otherwise. Evil. He had continued pecking at the keyboard as if lucky ineptitude would conjure from the dark portal the blip of returning consciousness. Jade, exasperated by his manic persistence, in which she rightly detected an element of anger directed at her, had left for work. In the fugue state of technological thwartedness, he heard the scream. Shot blazing down every dad nerve and danced backward to see out the French doors. Edmund hanging from the branch of the apricot tree, shrieking at his own daring. <laughs> With this shriek ringing in his ears, David lost his footing, and in a slow motion trance of remorse went over backwards. Falling, he seemed to view himself from above, and if he was helpless, his arms flung out and his mouth gaping, the back of his head about to connect with the floor, he was also suspended into a peaceful realm that had detached itself from terror. David had time to marvel at this double consciousness before the, fo before the floor slammed it out of his skull. My God, Susanna said, you could have been really hurt. And her palm on his nape radiates solicitude. But this kind of comforting costs her nothing, really. She can do it in her sleep. With the broad Norwegian plains of her wide open face, she's so different from Jane, so accessible. But you're okay, she says. Well, my back sort of. She turns his wrist to read his watch, and the telephone rings. The screen door bangs behind her long, freckled legs. Hi. You can't? You can't? I know, but why does it have to? I know it is, but why? I know. I know. I said I do know. Yes. I will. No, I won't. Me too. Me too. Bye. She's high enough from this abortive exchange to sit down beside David and confess. I think I'm in love. After all this time. I mean, you've been through two wives since me. My turn, I guess. The smile she gives him is expected, but he's having trouble reconciling the two realities. The reality before she vanished into the kitchen to add to the phone and this new version. Because weren't they still, until this confession, still really, in spite of everything, married? <laughs> <laughs> she has eluded him, slipped away, taking her critical, possessive, practical, generous, implacability and beautifully accessible love with her. And David says, miserably, oh. Oh? After I listened to the wonders of your love life for six years, oh? <laughs> That's not trying, David. That's not even nice. Oh? That's cold. I need to ask you about something. Such a transparent grab of her vanished attention. She grimaces, exaggerating the expression, but truly pissed off. Were you even listening? You're in love. And it's, from your side of the conversation, kind of complicated. When isn't it complicated? He uh-huh's prevaricatingly. She says, oh, of course. Marrying someone you barely know, that keeps everything nice and simple. I'm in trouble, Suze. You do know that you are completely selfish. But she's curious. <laughs> what kind of trouble? This is hypothetical. What if someone you were in love with turned out to be a Republican? <laughs> How bad would that be? Would that be something you would leave them over? Well, that couldn't happen. <laughs> sure it could. No, because when you're talking to a Republican, you can't talk long before you hear something, some opinion that makes your blood run cold. Like, 
what Emily Dickinson said about poetry. <laughs> it's poetry because it makes you feel like the top of your head's come off. That's how you know it's a Republican. <laughs> As she's been talking, she's been processing. Jade's a Republican? <laughs> David? She would be. But you're an activist. You can't possibly. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> this changes things. Of course it changes things. But he's confused. What things? <laughs> how does she discipline David? Are there bedtime prayers? I can't believe how trusting I've been. How naive. Intimidated. I was intimidated by her. I never really believed she liked the boys. She was probably <laughs> pretending to be into them out of some phony family values baloney. <laughs> or to get to you. Hey, you've seen her with the boys. You know she's... Well, wasn't Jane a little cold? Really? Confident, but maybe a little offhand. He chalked it up to her heavy workload to never have spent much time with the kids before. Suze, Suze, please, come to the house because I, I don't know whether I'm crazy to think that that rug might be... He can't say evil twice in one conversation. It makes no sense to blame the rug. Blame Jade. That's what you're trying to avoid with this obsession. You're resisting taking a good look at a relationship that was flawed from its very inception. If you look at it and say, there's nothing wrong, wrong with this rug, that's all I need to hear. Is that how obsessions work? <laughs> really? Snap out of it, guy. I mean, that works. In her twice weekly trips to the house to retrieve or deliver the boys, she has waited, eyes averted, outside the front door. And now, entering this bedroom, his and Jay's, Susanna appears struck by emotions David could probably have predicted. Jealousy, confusion, vengefulness. She gives the rug a perfunctory once over, but the unmade bed gets her complete attention. And then, oh shit, an actual daunting bra of Jay's. Silky cups upturned, and Susanna sits down on the rug and begins to cry. David rubs at his ill-shaven shin, weathering the storm, riding it out on the end of the rug. At last, her heart crying peters out and breath catches and little cries. He tears a tissue from a box on the nightstand and offers it. Thanks. She blows her nose and shudders. You want to tell me what's going on here? Who wouldn't help? You want to try? You tricked me. You went out ahead and made this other life, and you're hopeful. I was used to you being more or less despairing. It wasn't like I wanted you to despair, but I was used to things going wrong for you. With women. He doesn't intend to sit down next beside her. On his feet, he has some distance from the rugs of malign influence, which she succumbed to. <laughs> At the same time, it's kind of sexy, standing over Susanna like this, her head at crotch level. He quashes the thought. <laughs> if you were your old self, you'd never trust her again. She lied. But I don't understand how she got you in the first place. She might be able to get you back out would I know how much you could forgive? Suze, can you just see? I always thought in life that there was one person you got to know everything about. You get even one person, and it doesn't really matter whether you end up living with them or not, because the way you know that person, nothing can undo or diminish it. <coughs> There's one single person out of everybody on earth who is your own private, safe person, who you can talk to in your head and know what they'll say. Even when we broke up, you were still my one safe person. You know? But if you can turn out to have a Republican in the wife <laughs> and blame a run of bad luck on an evil rug, I guess I don't I don't know anything about anyone. Not really. I'm in love, and now you've made it, so I have to distrust you. Will you tell me something, David? 
Did I know you? Was I your person? Because if he answered her honestly, the answer would be no. Because he can't bear to hurt her from reckless solicitude. He rubs a palm down his fly. Suze, do you want to do something? <laughs> I want to do something, she says, standing. I want, and innocently unzipping, he's staggered by her swift backhanded blow, by the moan of protest that is neither his nor hers, causing them to turn, the ex-husband and wife, to find their child, <laughs> standing in the doorway in his pajama bottoms. <laughs> Honey, David says, shame, but after a long and disbelieving gaze that pivots from mother to father and father to mother, shame bolts. David caresses his jaw and says softly, he saw that. He was right there. Did he see what was before? The zipper? I don't think so, but he's not sure. David, let me take him home. I need to talk to him. Let me have this. He lets her have this. Edmund, discovered in the boys' room, turns piously cooperative, as if to preserve what's left of his family's sanity. Jackets are tugged on, backpacks snatched up, and as if the house is on fire, and Susanna hustles both boys out the front door where they encounter Jay. The women's voices spar in a little ecstasy of mutual dislike. <laughs> David stands there, apprehensively feeling his jaw, holding his own, if barely, against an onslaught of guilt. Before it can drag him under, he sits down. Here's the rug. He straightens glasses knocked cockeyed by Susanna's blow and trails a hand along its nape. Threads ran one way, a warp another, a wolf. Jade slams the front door. Okay, what is going on, she calls. Why was Susanna so weird? She goes, make him put some ice on it? He closes his eyes to postpone her interrogation. Meanwhile, attending to the throbbing in his jaw. Shit! Jay does the instinctive hopping step that keeps one foot from touching down, and in the second before he understands she's in pain, he thinks she is goofily performing her fear of radioactive contamination. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong? I stepped on something. Was there glass in this rug? Why didn't we vacuum? The trash can. The toxic seed of its debris. David is half sick with guilt, driving her to the emergency room, because some shard from that roly cauldron has driven itself into her darling foot. Because he brought the foul thing home in order to impress her. To prove he is not merely a dutiful soldier slogging through the muddy depositions, but a hero capable of wrestling beauty from chaos. The doctor is a sleekly handsome Indian with a tranquilizing lilt. But Jay won't melt. And when the doctor leaves the cubicle, and David explains in a low voice that the drug is behind everything that happened, <laughs> she shivers and commands, shut up. The handsome doctor enters then, bestowing on David a discreet frown of sympathy, an acknowledgment that Jade is not the only person suffering in this partially illuminated, far from soundproof cell. <laughs> to explain that he's fine, David touches a swollen jaw with two fingers. This. This is nothing. And now when the doctor frowns, there is no sympathy in it. <laughs> Submit to spousal abuse if you will. A blush creeps up to Jade's throat and tints her ears. Her shame exasperated by the doctor's indifference, for he, assuming she is a highly troubled individual, ably ignores her, bending to his task. Extracted from her heel, brandished under the hooded medical lamp, is a sliver of rusted metal. No, she can't remember when she had her last tetanus shot. Hatred figures in the look she gives David when the needle goes in. Yeah. We need to talk. I have to get to the office. With that foot? Left foot in a steep high heel, the injured right, right mummified in stretchy bandages and jammed into an old moccasin, she faces him asymmetrically. <laughs> do you know why they do this? Make the bandages beige? 
It's the shade of cadaverous Caucasian flesh. <laughs> it's an imitation of mortality. It's so that you wrap your rotting foot in your own future dead skin. <laughs> in frustration, she kicks off the high heel and tries a flat. I did hear what you said, and yes, we'll talk, but seriously, I have no time. This morning's the Kelsis thing. Kelsis, he calls. Kelsis? The thing, she calls over her shoulder. The thing I told you about. The thing she didn't tell him about. He needs to collect his wits. To shave skittishly around the swollen hinges of his jaw to negotiate rush hour traffic with zen serenity. To sit down at his desk and chart the decline of the black-footed ferret. He needs the escapism inherent in any ordinary bad day. After lunch, he opens a fat packet and informs him that he's been hit with a slap suit. Nobody else in Epic is named in the suit, only him. He is married to a lawyer and would solicit her ultra-competent advice, except that this morning she had said something about Kelsis. Kelsis is a small operation, mining operation near the Arizona border, whose radioactive runoff has been turning up in wells in the next county. Even worse, his rec records for the Kelsis suit like all the files on his computer, have vanished. He goes through his desk drawers, hoping to find pencil notes or a backup disk, holding some pertinent trace, but no, there's nothing. And in trying to reconstruct the basic outlines of the case, he loses track of time, and it is well past midnight when he turns the key in his front door. As was his habit on certain dire nights in his previous two marriages, he eats a bowl of children's cereal over the kitchen sink then swallows a couple of aspirin to mute the ache in his jaw and the pain in his back, which has bothered him more in the last 24 hours than it had since he fell. When he gazes into that room, Jade is sitting up in bed, a legal pad against her knees, spectacles on her nose, and though she knows he's there, she doesn't stop writing. That means either that she's hot after an idea or that last night's grievance, the belief that he was responsible for the needle piercing her foot has festered during ten professionally hostile hours at her firm. The rug has disappeared from the floor, he notes, and notes in himself the absence of any reaction to that loss, for which Jade will manufacture some credible explanation. But why does she get to preside over what goes, what stays? The rug was his catastrophe. He should say how it ends. The door to the boys' room is ajar. They're not right on. Shane's bed a mess because Shane is a poor sleeper, rousing and turning at the slightest sounds. The back of his mother's hand connecting with her father's jaw, say. <laughs> Neither boy's there, of course. There's no telling when Susanna will entrust them to this household again. The nightlight is a nautilus shell shielding a tiny bulb, and by its glow, David sits in the corner, wishing he could get the boys back. If he only had his boys here, asleep in his bed, he would begin to know how to set the rest of the world right. He would start with the sleep of his children and work out of it. When he comes back into the bedroom, Jade continues to scrawl her legal pad with corporate attorney trickery. Reasons radioactive well water is good for him, maybe. And if not that, then some other bullshit David or someone like him will have to contest. And with nothing left to lose, he lets his anger show. What did you do with it? She takes off her glasses, folds them, sets them on the nightstand. He might be some witness she's treating to this stilted performance, whose essence is her off-handed disbelief. How did we get here? When he doesn't answer, she says, you wanted it gone. You told Susanna start, things started to go wrong when it came into the house. When did you talk to Susanna? I called her to find out what was up last night, why she rushed off, how your face got hurt. What did she say? He's invested this question with telltale anxiety, and she frowns. She said, ask you. <laughs> Tossing the ball around, Shane threw a wild one. Looks worse than it is. She regards him gravely. She also wanted you to know that Nina called from Paris. She's flying home and she intends to take Edmund back with her. Evidently, I'm not to be trusted with either child. But 
the boys have never been apart. Looks like they will be now, because I'll make them say bedtime prayers for the help of Dick Cheney. <laughs> I'll knit them little American flag sweaters and Mark Darwin. She shakes her head. When you didn't come home, when you didn't call and your cell went right to voicemail, I couldn't sit here stewing, could I? I followed your map. That road was awful. It took me an hour each way, but I thought things would calm down if you knew the rug had gone back to where it came from. Evil. Susanna said, you said evil. You've been so irrational about this rug. What he wants to say. The whole world could have gone up lying. Could have gone up fucking up weather and watersheds and the marrow of little kids' jeans, and I could have stayed steady. I would have been able to bear it, day after day, as long as there was you. Here, in our house, you to come home to, you whole and sane and beautiful, and telling me the truth, what he does say, keeping his tongue even. Can you see why it bothers me? You should have waited to talk to me. We could have decided together how to deal with the rug. That's how people who trust each other behave. No. Something needed to be done. You can trust me to see things as they are and to act. You are used to such compliance with Suzanne. After her, Nina, Shmina, who from everything you say, despite her supposed feminist credentials, was basically this mouse. Now there's me, and right, you and I don't know everything about each other, and we never will. And what matters is how, Dave, you're leaving? David? The road unwinds before him in moonlight. Roughly as ever, only half a million. <laughs> he takes his curves too fast, absorbing the adrenaline hit whenever a chump of chola looms in the headlights, or a, red or a redoubt of sandstone. Once a coyote ghosts across the road and the station wagon fishtails to a halt, swallowed in its own dust. The wipers squeal, clearing the haze. Dirty rivulets rippling horizontally as David picks up speed. The desert laid out for him in luminous swipes. Loss, a particular taste in his mouth, a rising bitterness he can't swallow away. His heartbeat manic. Though it had been calm while he stood listening to Jay, there are no boys in the car to heed the warning, but David lectures. Careful, careful, you'll get there, you'll find it. It was there once, it will be there again. Have a little faith. But the oil drum pierced on the spur of rock is empty. Turned over on its side, rocking when he nudges it with a toe, it's trash, blown over its rim, he supposes, scattered across the floor of the arroyo. Rags fluttering for prickly pear, shards variously gleaming. She left the rug here, she said. It must have been around sunset. It's unlikely that anyone has driven the road since then. The wind has been hard at work, lashing and moaning. Could the rug have been lifted and sailed over the rim? Here is the trail, wide enough to suit deer or two small boys, but tricky for a grown man. Stones kick loose by his missteps, Preceding him in clamoring showers, his descent entirely audible, if there was anyone to hear. The interior of that tilted refrigerator is pierced by spokes of moonlight. Bullet holes. Paperbacks, cartwheel past, shedding pages. When he picks his way among the wreckage, he meets another moon, hanging in the unsmashed headlight of a wrecked truck. The starry refraction of the light come from some unearthly source. David makes for that glow, eking out from under the tilted wing of an airplane. The throb in his jaw is worse, the pain in his back nagging, but apart from that, he feels good. <laughs> Looser, a little winded, but freer, defiant, trying to recall the last time he pursued something, some aim or intention under the night sky. Twenty years ago, with the other four, his brothers, prowling a mesa in the dark, tossing survey stakes over the rim after pouring sugar in a back hose gas tank. Nothing he does now can compare with the satisfaction of that sabotage. 
with its clean, unequivocal high. He's grown old, tame as office air. Jade, have your visor for a time. When a chip of stone grazes his chest, its sting and the primal weirdness of being struck by a flying object in the dark brings David totally awake. But when he squints around, there's only the gusting sand. Cholo rearing up spookily to his left, his shadow dipping and lengthening as he hikes toward the glow. A campfire, maybe? Something pelts his chest again, then his arm. And before he can shield his eyes, he's assailed by a whirlwind of grit and twigs. Bewildered, he walks right into it, grazed, poked, showered with debris, leaves, twigs, and scouring sand. If she were with him, Jade would hide her face against his chest, and he'd shelter her as best he could, her ferocious lawyer hair lashing his face. And even with the wind whipping and scouring, they could protect each other. David reels along blindly, and from the way his, light, his long strain, he understands he must be shouted, though he can't hear himself over the wind. This is what he has seen happen to small, ball-headed children. Death blows you away while you struggle. The truth, the outrage, dying in your throat. Flinging the last handful of grit, the blast relents. David has passed among the chola unscathed, and here is the shelter under the airplane's wing, from which a lantern is suspended, shining down on a boy and girl entwined on his rug. <laughs> <laughs> its arabesque is dim, its choir of blues bleached to lunar grays and faint violet. The boy is fast asleep, but not the girl. The girl is awake. She tightens her arms around her boyfriend and lifts her chin defiantly. She's got the inky hair favored by punked out runaways, a, a fright wig trailing sharp fangs over her forehead. The pinched together brows and eye holes whose expression can't be deciphered. When he takes a small step toward his rug, she flashes a palm. Stop. He takes another step and gets both palms. Stop. She wants nothing more than to stop him, and he stops. It all stops. Moon, love, breath, heartbeat. David sprawls there, feeling the hardness of the ground, the nerve revival of panic, the terror that she won't know what to do, that she's stoned and can't help. The wind dies down, and the moonlight flicks and he doesn't know what comes next on this earth. No one knows. But there are footsteps coming toward him. If there is any chance of saving a life through the sheer force of one's love for it, he is already saved.